This year, almost every university on the planet started scrambling to move all of their teaching online in response to COVID-19. To do this, to put classes online, academics are choosing between one of two approaches. Video conferencing like Zoom, where the teacher and the student are connected at the same time, and video like on YouTube, where students can watch pre-recorded content. Most people understand that this is a necessary change in the short term to deal with the pandemic, but some people argue that we need to go back to face-to-face -to -face teaching as soon as possible after all this is over. As Daniel Deming argues in the New York Times, important aspects of education are best done by teachers in more intimate settings. With our review, we tried to see whether or not that was really true. I got interested in this problem about five years ago when my team and I were getting excited about flipped classrooms. They're much more popular now, but at the time, they're a new way of teaching. Instead of giving lectures and then setting worksheets for homework, put the lectures online for students to do before class and then do the worksheets in a collaborative, interactive workshop. We randomly allocated a few hundred students into a normal class, a flipped class, and just for fun, we had an online class who got everything delivered via videos, maybe expecting that class not to do as well. They actually did fine. There were no differences on quizzes or exams or assessments. What was going on? We wanted to see if our study was the exception to the rule, so we did a systematic review. We went to find every other study like ours that measured objective learning after university students were randomly assigned to get videos. We wanted to make sure that we were only looking at real differences here, not just student preferences. So as a result, we excluded studies that only asked students for opinions. And we excluded studies that were non-randomised because otherwise students could just be choosing the type of learning that they wanted. We only included randomised control trials with objective measures of learning as the outcome. So we weren't just relying on student preferences or enjoyment. We found over a hundred studies and the results blew us away. A quarter of these studies gave video in addition to existing content. And as you'd expect, students who got extra stuff learned more. That was pretty obvious. But we also found 83 studies that swapped some type of teaching for videos. That's where things get really interesting. Most of the time, students learn more when given a video instead of a class. You can see the effect size for swapping a class for a video is 0.18, which is about the same benefit as giving everybody in the class high self-esteem. Compared to a reading or a website, video is even better, with effect sizes of 0.51, bigger than offering a full virtual reality environment. It didn't matter if videos were swapped for lectures or tutorials. It didn't matter if the videos were used for one brief session or for the whole semester. And it didn't matter if the exam was right after the video or at the end of the semester. Videos were consistently good for learning. And we think there are a few reasons why. There are four main reasons why videos work well, which we'll go through. Let me explain each of them here. First of all, students have two main channels for learning. One for the things that they see and one for the things that they hear. And lots of different ways of learning, including videos and face-to-face -face classes, can be built to use both channels well. We found videos were much better than books, websites, or podcasts, and we think that's because videos use both channels, when these other things only use one or the other. But why then are videos better than classes? And I think it's because us academics aren't perfect. We make mistakes when giving live views. We make mistakes when giving live classes, and we can edit ourselves on video. This means we can more carefully present information so it's easy to understand. It's easy to design videos so that students are best using their brains for learning. If you're interested in some evidence-based ways of doing this, see the link to the how-to videos in the description. But it's not just us academics who have more control when learning with video. Students get more control too. They can speed us up, slow us down, stop to take notes, or have a break for a coffee. With video, students have control to learn when they want and at the speed that they want. All of these things allow students to regulate the amount of information they're taking in so that they can master the content without getting overwhelmed. Pragmatically, they can also learn where they want, when they want, meaning life is less likely to get in the way of learning. Next, we can't always give students a realistic view of what we're teaching in class, but with videos we can show them the real thing. If you're learning to do CPR, for example, students in the class will only get to see a demonstration, hopefully anyway, although my wife says I'm heart stopping on stage. They probably see a demonstration from a distance in a room full of dozens of other students. In contrast, videos allow students to see real demonstrations with real people. Videos can give a unique perspective that can't easily be seen in a class. Students can even see the skill through the eyes of the performer. This may explain why videos, while good for learning knowledge, were excellent for learning skills. 
As you can see here, the effect sizes were around 0.44, which is about as good as many full virtual reality simulations. Students learn skills better from videos because they can see authentic demonstrations up close and personal. Finally, videos work well because teachers can make them as interactive or more interactive compared to many other classes. In our flipped classroom study, we were careful to make sure our videos were as interactive as our face-to-face -face lecture. If the lecturer stopped to ask a class a question, the video was stopped and asked the same question of the online students. And our meta-analysis found that most of the time, teachers were able to make videos as interactive as those face-to-face -face classes. When they did, videos were better for all the reasons we've described so far. When they didn't, when classes were more interactive, videos were no longer better. And they were the same, if not worse, than those classes. So interactivity is really important. The more interactivity and the more feedback students get, the better they learn. But just because classes are face-to-face -face doesn't mean they're interactive, and just because they're online doesn't mean they're passive. Most classes aren't that interactive, and video can be easily made more interactive too. Websites like Khan Academy, Edpuzzle, and H5P do a great job of showing how you can make videos interactive by asking lots of questions with high quality feedback. When we move content online, we can keep classes interactive. And when we do that, videos are likely to be better than the traditional ways of running classes. So those four key reasons video works well are that it's easier to design videos so that students are best using their brains for learning. Students have control to learn when they want and at the speed that they want. Videos can give a unique perspective that can't easily be seen in class. And most classes aren't that interactive and video can be easily made as interactive if not more interactive than those classes. Our review wasn't all sunshine and lollipops. Very few of the studies met the best practice guidelines for research design and by only using randomized trials, the studies might not be a realistic representation of higher education. But if you want to know more about these limitations and how researchers could address them, you'll have to read the full paper. Still, Deming's argument in the New York Times might be right, but it's unrealistic. Yes, students thrive off learning environments where they're collaboratively solving interesting problems in small groups and getting lots of feedback from an instructor. But is that how you remember your time at university? Not me. I remember sitting in long lectures either bored because it was too easy or overwhelmed because it was just way too hard. Videos can and probably should replace all of the classes that look like a traditional lecture. Because teachers can edit themselves, they can do a better job of presenting the material in a clear and coherent way. Because students can fast forward and rewind, they can make the lessons easier or more difficult as they want. And because they're not constrained by a two hour booking in a lecture hall, videos can be more easily broken up into bite sized chunks with questions and feedback in between. Yes, small group and hands on learning is great. But I've found teaching by video has freed up time so that I can better prepare these hands-on experiences. And students need to learn stuff before they can start using that knowledge to solve problems. And the best way to learn that stuff is by video. Also, students learn to problem solve more effectively when we give them a worked example first, where we walk through how to do it before asking them to do it themselves. At the moment, videos do these things pretty much better than anything else. So in short, I don't want to be replaced by a YouTube playlist, but parts of my teaching are probably better that way.